Very good. So welcome to the last lecture of my course and of the whole school. <laughs> uh, I owe you two answers before I start. Today we will uh, see once again supergravity at work, meaning that I will discuss black hole solutions in supergravity. Uh, well, of course, not all possible solutions but uh, the basic uh, ideas and properties of black hole solutions in supergravity so that we see, first of all, how uh, one discusses different solutions than the vacuum solution, when one wants to find supersymmetric solutions, and the additional properties that you have when you consider, uh, first of all, supersymmetric black holes, and uh, more in general, extremal black holes in, uh, within a supergravity theory. As I said before, I owe you two answers. Uh, the first one about the instantons, uh, the duality that we are discussing here that I discussed yesterday uh, is a duality that is not just the Hodge duality as I showed you. It reduces to the Hodge duality if you just consider the pure Maxwell theory. But if you consider more involved theories, as you saw, there are scalars involved, uh, not simply uh, the Hodge duality. You get both the dual, the Hodge dual involved in the relation, again, the field strength with scalar dependence. And second, all these field strengths are always abelian. So when you go and try and extend this uh, to non-abelian gauge theories, what you see is that duality relations, the duality that I mentioned, are important in the sense that they constrain what kind of gauge group you can introduce. Because duality essentially uh, fixes a certain uh, transformation property of the field strengths of your theory. And therefore, when you promote them to uh, uh, to non-abelian theories, you will have that the non-abelian gauge group will be generically a subgroup of this symplectic group. Uh, but then you break the duality group, essentially, because when you deform the theory and introduce non-abelian couplings, then uh, the duality group is not preserved anymore, only a subgroup is preserved. So generically, the answer is no. Uh, for the other question instead, uh, yes, uh, what you can do, so about the fact that you can always find a prepotential for n equals 2 vector multiplets, uh, what is true is that in every patch you can always find a symplectic transformation of the sections such that there is a prepotential. This, however, doesn't mean that can do globally this thing in a way that is compatible with the uh, compatibility conditions that you need to have in different patches. If you remember, we said no, that when you have uh, different patches, these have to be related by transformations. I don't know, SAB, SBC, SCA, some symplectic transformations such that, of course, SAB, SBC, SCA is the identity. And I don't know of any proof that tells you that you can do this globally. I'm not aware of a proof of that. I look back at the literature, also because when we were writing the book, we went uh, thoroughly through the literature because there were some confusing statements also about the, especially about the supergravity case, because we, which are really the necessary conditions because it's rather tricky. Uh, but uh, again, you can always do it in a single patch you can probably do it in every patch, but who tells you that these transformations are the one that you need in each patch and that you need in order to transition from one patch to the other, satisfy this condition? This is not obvious. So my statement is locally you can always do it in a patch. Can you do it globally? Not sure. Prepotential is going to be, uh, is it a section now, the prepotential? Um, I'm not even sure about that. Uh, the, the, the transformation. 
transform, you see, the transformation property of the, that's exactly the problem. The prepotential, when you do a genetic transformation, a, a genetic symplectic transformation does not transform uh, in, in a covariant way or whatever funny way you can imagine because there are transformations that do not generate a new prepotential starting from a prepotential. So there's no way I think you can uh, make that argument. So, I mean, it's a mathematics problem, if you wish, but it's, uh, I don't think uh, there is uh, an answer, at least I'm not aware of an answer for that. So you can surely find it locally. I'm not sure you can do it globally. Um, I'm not saying you cannot. I'm just saying I don't know. I didn't find any, any, any proper proof of that. So let me now discuss black holes in A equals 2 supergravity. So theory is a special case of the theories that we discuss more in general when you couple gravity to scalar fields and electro fields. And this is the part that we are interested in. Of course, there will be gravitinos and there will be gaginos. But of course, we, we are interested in black hole solutions, which are solutions of the metric charged, so of course you will have uh, that the uh, Maxwell uh, fields that you have here, the NV vector multiplets, uh, depending on the charges that you turn on, will have fluxes. Uh, they will be supported by scalars, but all the fermions are going to be vanishing on the background, of course. We, we are not breaking Lorentz invariance, the fermions are not uh, turned on. Still, if we're interested in supersymmetric solutions, clearly we have to look at the supersymmetric transformations of the gravitinos and of the gaginos. Now in n equals 2, you have gravitinos, so A goes from 1 to 2, and you have each vector multiplet, you have again two gagini. So the supersymmetry parameters are also 2, and the transformations are more or less what you would expect, meaning that uh, the transformation rule of the gravitino goes into the derivative of the supersymmetry parameter. This is the covariant derivative, which contains the spin connection and contains the Kähler connection, the Q that we have discussed. Plus, there is a combination here of the various gauge fields. And why is that? Because you know that in the n equals 2 multiplet, you don't have just the gravitino and gravity, but you also have the gravi-photon. So, the transformation rule of the gravitino should go, depending on the supersymmetry, once to the graviton and once to the gravi-photon. So clearly you must have here the gravi-photon field strength. Now, the problem, uh, discussing what I uh, discussed yesterday, mentioning what I discussed yesterday, the problem is that what is the gravi-photon among the is not obvious. It depends on the couplings, on the point on the manifold where you are. So this combination T mu nu, which is a combination of the scalar field, this is the kinetic, which depends on the scalar fields. This L sigma, nothing but e to the k over 2 times the x sigma that I discussed yesterday. So the, the holomorphic sections, the projective coordinates, if you wish. Uh, and, and this essentially acts as a projector. It takes a linear combination of all vector fields and tells you which combination of the vector fields is the gravi-photon. Okay? So in the transformation rule of the gravitino, you have the gravi-photon. In the transformation rule of the gagini, you have the scalars in the, in the vector multiplets and you have the other vector multiplets. So again, you have some combination of the scalar field, of the vector fields, sorry, that projects out from this expression the gravi-photon. So essentially, these combinations that I call t mu nu and h mu nu are nothing but combinations of the vector fields such that at each point on the scalar manifold, you know exactly, if you would sit there and would do an expansion, which is the gravi-photon and which are the other vector fields. Okay? So this is the generic structure. And of course, we're interested in solutions, in black hole solutions, and we're interested in black hole solutions that are... Uh, supersymmetric, in particular, well, and more in general, actually, we are interested in extremal black holes. Now, extremal, as I will show you later, doesn't mean necessarily BPS, doesn't mean supersymmetric. I will show you that supersymmetric means extremal, 
implies extremal, but not the other way around. Okay, this is a first statement because the, 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 when people get confused about that, supersymmetry, of course, usually tells you what are the, the threshold states. No, the supersymmetric states are those that have a minimum mass for a given charge, that's fine. But there might exist configurations, and I will show you that there are configurations for which you can have an extremization of the mass for given charges, which is not supersymmetric and, and still extremal. And of course, we're interested in charge configurations, which means that I'm assuming that these field strength here, uh, the uh, electric field strength and the dual will have a flux. And this flux is going to be given by the electric and magnetic charges. Now, you know, the, the, flux, of the, the, the flux of the field strength that gives you the electric charge is the flux of the dual, no? You have to do the integral over the sphere or star of f in order to get the electric charge. So this is the thing where, of course, my g lambdas are given in terms of the original field strengths in this way. So, of course, you see, this already tells you that things are also starting to become a bit more complicated when you talk about quantization of the charge. Because, you see, it's not the field strength that has the charge, a flux with But it's this field strength, which is the rest field strength with scalar fields. OK? So depending on the value of the scalar fields, you get the charge. So you have to be careful about uh, defining charges properly when you, end, when, when you are in a theory with, uh, with scalar fields, where you have no minimal couplings. OK? This is a very delicate point, which I will not discuss much because I will not be interested much in the quantization, but if you eventually want to match this with uh, what comes from string theory, the number of d-brains that you have, then you have to be careful because it's not genetically, this is not the flux of, the, of, of, of star f, but it's the flux of star f dressed plus f dressed again with the scalar fields. Now, uh, as I said, I'm interested in uh, extremal. They remove the. Huh. I have only this. I'm sorry. I know that this doesn't erase as well as the clothes, but no. Ah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> sorry. I was looking at the scarf, and I thought, OK, <laughs> no, not really nice to take the scarf of somebody and clean the blackboard, but anyway. Uh, so uh, the thing that, that uh, we're interested in are extrema configurations. So just to remind you, uh, take a Reisner Nordstrom black hole in, in uh, 4D Maxwell Einstein, Maxwell Einstein gravity. OK, so you have Einstein and Maxwell. This is GR. You know this uh, uh, for sure than me, uh, you take a configuration that preserves spherical symmetry, so you have some factor that depends on the radial coordinate, and here you have the sphere ele line element, the usual line element like that, and then uh, uh, of course, you will uh, uh, introduce charges for the vector fields accordingly. Uh, well, you will have that uh, AT will have some expression like that. Uh, sorry, with like that. It, this is the potential. Uh, and if you look at the solution, you will get that this factor here becomes the following. So that uh, the horizons, there are two horizons on the values of m and q. And this will be uh, the two roots of this expression. So the two zeros, essentially, of f. There you get the two killing horizons. These are the exter external and internal horizon. Now you will have a singularity. 
uh, at r equals 0, you can compute, for instance, the Ricci square. Uh, of course, when q goes to 0, the Ricci square does not vanish, but you can take the Riemann square, and that is still, uh, sorry, it vanishes, so you don't get the singularity anymore, but in that limit, you can take the Riemann square, so they see that r equals 0 is always a singularity. The point is that you have two horizons, and we're assuming, and this is the adapted co this is this, the metric in adapted coordinates to an observer that sits out here, okay? And you see that in the special case where m is equal to q, then you have that the two horizons merge, you get a double zero, and uh, this gives an extremal configuration. How do you distinguish an extremal configuration from a generic one? Well, if you look at the near horizon geometry, for instance, of a generic black hole, you get Rindler 2 times the sphere, in this case. Uh, Rindler, you know, is the metric uh, uh, of an accelerated observer, and that's what happens if you're very close to the horizon. But if you take the extremal case, the extremal near horizon configuration becomes ADS2 times S2. So you don't have Rindler anymore. Of course, you still have the sphere, and that's what allows you to compute the area of the black hole. No, it's uh, related to the area of this sphere. That's what we usually interpret as area of the black hole. Uh, but now, the two-dimensional part on which our space-time has been compatified at the horizon becomes ADS2. So the difference is essentially that uh, while in one case uh, the horizon is at a finite distance from uh, an observer, finite proper distance, ADS2 is a space that has an infinite throat. And this means that the horizon sits at infinite proper distance from any observer. And, and this is, if you wish, also related to the fact that uh, extremal configuration have zero temperature, okay, are very special configurations, so you don't expect them to radiate, but essentially because the redshift is infinite, no, you have this, uh, uh, these horizons uh, infinitely far away from any, any other point in your uh, space-time here. So uh, this is a peculiar point which, however, is important for what we're going to say uh, later. And uh, the reason why this is also uh, important uh, is, well, for sure for certain properties that we're going to study, but also because extremal configurations, precisely because of these properties, somehow you assume that they are stable, no? They are extremal configurations that are going to be stable, and hence that is where you have most chances to understand and explain the entropy from a microscopic point of view. If you have temperature, of course, things become a bit more complicated. Now, so far, so good. So uh, let me now, uh, yeah, let me use this part here. Let me now look at spherical symmetric configurations of that theory. Now, I don't have just one Maxwell field but I have NV Maxwell fields. Ah, yeah, sorry. I took the cloth and then I forgot it. Okay, so the ansatz for is an ansatz, of course, that is again compatible with the spherical symmetry, but I'm doing a change of coordinates, of radial coordinates, because I'm interested in, uh, in these extremal configurations. And these extremal configurations, uh, you can show in the previous ansatz, essentially, that uh, the extremal configurations uh, have a three-dimensional part here, which is essentially flat. This is 
three-dimensional Euclidean space. This is also, by the way, interesting because the extrema configurations have the same charge as mass. Now, take the Newtonian force between two such black holes, m squared over r squared, and take this, the electrostatic repulsion, q squared over r squared. Since m is equal to q, these black holes feel a no-force condition, which is something that you expect, for instance, when you have supersymmetric deep brains configurations. So that's exactly what happens, no? And this means that uh, since they feel a no-force condition, you can put two such black holes wherever you want. You make them sit there, and they will stay there. And uh, actually, you can prove that the solution uh, in the case of the reisner nostrum solution, uh, these functions that you get are essentially harmonic functions, which means that actually you can even consider very easily multi-center configurations. So, you know, in gravity, uh, because you have linear equations, you have to study each solution separately somehow. Now, if you have one black hole solution, fine. You take another black hole solution, you cannot just superimpose them. It's not, not like electromagnetism, no? If you take two black hole solutions and you put them in your space, you get something which is not a solution genetically. Here instead, in the extremal case, because of these properties, uh, you can generate multicenter solutions very easily. And this is another appealing feature of the extremal solutions in Minkowski space-time here. Uh, to do some, such a thing in anti de Sitter, for instance, is a, still an open problem. But this is interesting because this is a way also to transition from this simple black hole solution to something which is a bit more complicated, which has more structure, and which might allow you to construct the microstate geometries if there is a classical description for them. Anyway, uh, uh, the, this is the answer. Often use actually is a bad name. Let me call it. Uh, a coordinate that is related to R uh, in this way, uh, because the equations will be more simple in the W coordinate than in the R coordinate. Uh, but uh, so when I will write a prime, this will mean D in DW in the following equations. Okay. Uh, of course, everything has to depend only on the radial variable. Call it R, call it W, doesn't matter. And uh, now, the thing, though, is that we have both vectors and dual vectors. We have a number of them. And you can write, therefore, an ansatz for these things with an electric field. And here, the magnetic charge or a magnetic field and the electric charge. And of course, these two fields should not be independent. In fact, the electric potential should contain the electric charge eventually. Uh, and, yeah. I'm looking at extremal solutions. So if you, th if you think about the thing I, I showed you before, the, the, the factor F, this, OK? When m is equal to q, this becomes m squared. And this thing can be written down as 1 over r squared r minus m squared. And then you can redefine your R by shifting it in this way, and you end up having exactly a metric like that. So R is no longer static. Yeah, no, you shift it in this way, yes. But uh, uh, I mean, it depends what you're interested in, uh, in, in studying. No, we're interested in the metric from the horizon outside. So I don't care about what happens in the other patch. Anyway, I will have to to see how the solution extends beyond the horizon, no? But so this is the, these are the uh, vector fields. And now, as I said, I, I'm introducing redundant degrees of freedom here, of course. 
Now, in my Langan, I only have the electric strand, so I have only the chi's, I have the p's. Uh, I can uh, write down, of course, the relation that comes out of this, that, that relates this quantity. But I can simply impose this from the conditions of motion of my Lagrangian. If I take my Lagrangian, that depends, first of all, it will depend on chi prime. Chi will never appear, of course, naked in the Lagrangian. No, I only have the field strength, so I will always have only first derivatives. Uh, then I will have my, my charges, the magnetic charges, and the scalar fields. Okay? This is my Lagrangian after I, I use this ansatz into the Lagrangian, and the warp factor, of course. And now what I do is I take this Lagrangian and I add a total derivative. like this. This is clearly a total derivative in R. Obviously, the integration in theta and phi and t can be removed. No, You will have a volume factor, but I don't care about that volume factor, because I'm saying everything depends only on the radial variable. So effectively, I have a one-dimensional problem. And if I introduce this uh, total derivative now, because integrating in dr, this is just a total derivative, then you see that the equation of motion for chi prime is precisely the equation of motion that you would get, uh, uh, the duality that you would get from here. Which tells you that you can replace, which tells you that in your theory you can start from an ansatz like this, this expression for the potential, forgetting about the dual one, but introducing this total derivative term and using its equations of motion, the equations of motion for chi prime, no? or if you wish, the other way is to say, OK, the chi prime appear only under derivatives. So clearly, their equations of motion will tell you that chi prime is going to be conserved. You will have conserved charges. And these conserved charges are precisely these q lambdas here. But the interesting thing is that the relation you get is exactly the relation that you would get by solving these duality uh, relations as well. And then if you do this and you plug it in your action, the result is a one-dimensional problem, which is given by the following Lagrangian. So this is the one-dimensional reduced Lagrangian. Now remember, we are reducing also over time. No? Now, we're not doing a really a compatification. We're just forgetting about the integration in t, in phi, in theta. I don't care. Because all those are just giving me numbers that I don't care. Everything depends only on the radial variable. So I will have a Euclidean action, essentially. And you see, r is the geometry. So uh, since in the metric I have only the word factor u from r up to total derivatives, I get a term which is the derivative of the work factor square. Then I have the kinetic term of the scalar fields, which of course I'm assuming now will depend only on the radial variable. I want to preserve spherical symmetry, so also the scalars, if they have uh, a, a, a profile, they will have only a radial profile. And then I have the reduction of the electromagnetic Lagrangian, and this gives me a war factor like this again, and then I have what is called the black hole potential, which depends on the scalars. And you see, this expression will depend on the scalars, because I have I lambda sigma, R lambda sigma, which depend on the scalars. And then my field strength, instead, contains simply the charges, because I have my ansatz uh, up there, that tells me that this is some charge here, and the chi lambda, the derivative of chi lambda, can also be replaced with scalars and charges. So eventually, I get an expression here, which has the following form, which is given in terms of the charges, some matrix that depends on the scalar fields, where this matrix M, obviously, from what you read here, is given in terms of the matrices R and I.
and there are some signs which are convention dependent, but the structure is going to be this, where Q is the vector of charges which contains the magnetic charges and then the electric charges. This is also a symplectic vector, not the one that we discussed yesterday. Because you have the field strength and the dual field strength, you have the charges and the dual charges. Now, this is my Lagrangian in one dimension. If I look at the equations of motion of such a Lagrangian, I get an equation for the work factor, an equation for the scalar fields, which are, of course, second-order equations. However, these are the equations of motion that come from that one-dimensional action, but this one-dimensional action is not a consistent truncation of the original system. Now, in supergravity, you always have to be careful about this, because uh, I mean, besides this particular example, when we discuss supergravity theories, I told you that genetically supergravity theories could be considered effective theories coming from string theory. Now, an effective theory is, of course, an approximation. And you might have that you solve the equations of motion of that effective theory, and then the solution will receive correction as you correct the effective theory action. Now, when you go to higher and higher energy, you will get additional correction to the action. The, the, the solution is going to be corrected. A different story are theories with which are consistent truncations. What does it mean to be a consistent truncation? It means that the equation of motion of the theory that you derived, for instance, by compatification, by dimensional reduction, which is what we're doing here effectively, solve also the original equations of motion. So this would mean effectively that your Lagrange that you have, your theory that you have, contains the same information about at least that particular sector that you're considering, because when you do a truncation, no, here I'm making an ansatz. I'm taking my metric, and I'm saying the metric contains only one degree of freedom here. I'm removing all sorts of degrees of freedom there. So of course, I'm, I'm forcing, I'm setting to zero some degrees of freedom. When I'm setting to zero some degrees of freedom, I may not be able to do it consistently, meaning that if I do that, the equations of motion that I derive are not uh, from the reduced action are not solutions of the original equations of motion. And this is indeed the case. In fact, if you look at the four-dimensional Maxwell and Einstein equations of motion, you get indeed these two, but you get a third equation from the Einstein equations, which is called the Hamiltonian constraint, for a reason that is obvious, will be obvious in a second. And the Hamiltonian constraint tells you that u prime square plus the scalar squared derivatives uh, is equal to e to the 2u v black hole. So you see, I call this Hamiltonian constraint because essentially it's, it's the Lagrangian where you flip the sign of the potential. So if one is, is, is kinetic term minus potential, well, now we are in Euclidean space. So one is kinetic plus V, and the other one is kinetic minus V. But essentially, that's the idea. When you have the Lagrangian, you have the Hamiltonian. But uh, the, the, the point is precisely this, that this Lagrangian is not a consistent truncation, meaning that if you look at solutions of the equations of motion of this Lagrangian, they will not be genetically solutions of the original four-dimensional system unless you impose this additional equation. If you impose all these equations, then you have a solution to the equations of motion of the original system. This is the difference between consistent truncation and instead effective theory, okay, where you could have solutions which are approximations. And in supergravity, both are interesting. For instance, when you take type 2b on ADS5 cross S5, you can study five-dimensional supergravity on ADS5, and you know that uh, this five-dimensional maximal supergravity on ADS-5 is a consistent truncation of the original system, meaning that if you look at the vacuum of this theory, for instance, you find new vacuum of the original theory. 
So you start from ADS5 cross S5, which is dual, for instance, to N equals 4 superior means using the, the gauge gravity correspondence. And by looking at the other vacua, you find new vacua of this theory in five dimensions, which are also vacua of the original theory, and therefore uh, you will have duals for these deformations as well. This, however, is not an effective theory. Why it's not a good effective theory? Because the radius of ADS and the radius of the sphere are the same. So this means that your internal space has a size which is essentially the same of your space-time. So it's not compact, it's not small. You cannot neglect the higher kaluza klein modes in your theory. Okay, you will have states in your theory which have masses which are comparable with those that you truncated away. So this is not a good effective theory, but it's a good truncation. So it's important to know this difference. And in supergravity, we have supergravities that are very useful because they are consistent truncations, and we have other supergravities that are useful because they are effective theories. But you have to be careful about what you're doing. So now, beside the detour, coming back to our point, this is the Lagrangian, this is the equation that we want to solve. Okay? Now, we are saying that we are interested in extremal solutions. So extremal solutions means that now your scalars will start from a certain value at infinity. So assume that you have your problem essentially is something like that. You have n equals to Minkowski vacuum in four dimensions where you can choose the value of the scalar fields as you like. There is no scalar potential in this theory. So you start from a certain point where you have that the scalar have a certain value at infinity. And then you see you have some equations here that show that these scalars will change their value according to the gradient of the potential, of the black hole potential that I wrote down. So somehow, they will follow some path, and they end up at the horizon. Now, the point is that we are interested in solutions that at the horizon see an ADS2. So we are interested in uh, extremal solutions, which means that the ADS2 crosses two point is at infinite proper distance, which means that the scalar field continue to move and to change their value for an Time. And now you see the problem. This means that this, the derivative of the scalars, when you approach ADS2 cross S2, should go to zero. Otherwise, if you get a slope, the scalars will blow up. Now, if you have a derivative, a z prime, which is different from zero, since here you have an infinite distance to the horizon, if z prime comes to be different from zero, at some point, I mean, you will end up having plus or minus infinity. So this means that in order the scalars should have a z prime that as you get to the horizon goes to zero. So this means that in extremal configurations, and this is the interesting thing, so when you get to the horizon, the extremal configurations should have that the derivative of the scalar goes to zero, so they get to a fixed point. And the interesting thing, and this is called the attractor mechanism, this value does not depend on the starting point. And this is a very nice and important feature on which I will come back later. So the whole solution, of course, will depend on the asymptotic value, and then when you flow, you get to another value. But this value here, uh, these are the scalars, z horizon, is the same no matter where you start from. Well, with some caveats that I will explain later. But whereas in a regular solution, in a, in a non-extremal solution, since the distance is finite, the horizon, let's say, is here, you can get different solutions with different values of the scalar fields. And there is no problem if the scalar fields still have a charge, I mean, if they still have a derivative which is non-zero. Because, well, you'll get there in a finite time, so it doesn't matter, the slope. 
But if you get in an infinite time, now, I mean, an infinite distance, I mean, time in the sense of the evolution of the flow, which is a radial flow, then it shouldn't have a slope. Otherwise, the scalar will blow up. And the reason why this is interesting and important, which I'll come back later, is that the angle should be proportional to the area of a 4, and will depend on the charges, but in principle, it can depend also on the scalar fields. Because you see, from the ansatz, the area is going to depend on what this work factor does. And the equation for this work factor depends on the scalar potential, which depends on the charges. This depends on the charges, of course, and on the scalar fields. So in principle, the entropy could depend now on continuous parameters, the values of the scalar fields. And then you see, if you want to give an inter a micro microscopic interpretation, this could be a serious problem. In this case, instead, you see, and I will show you later, that the value of the scalars at the horizon is fixed in terms of the charges, which means that you end up having an expression here, which is the charges and the scalar, but the scalars are also a function of the charges, so that eventually this depends only on the charges, which means that for given charges, which are quantized, you will get a definite value of the entropy. And if you interpret then these charges as the sum of, of microscopic objects, this gives you a chance to interpret the, the entropy from a microscopic point of view, which will be very difficult if you have continuous parameters. OK? So let me see now. The I have until 12.45. I have an hour now. OK, good. I'll take less, hopefully, today, but we'll see. So as I said, I'm interested here in solutions which are extremal. Let me start first from supersymmetric solutions. As I said, extremal might not mean supersymmetric, but supersymmetric implies extremality. Why do I want to start from supersymmetric solutions? Well, for various reasons. First of all, because supersymmetric solutions means I want to set to zero these equations. And since I'm doing it now for black hole than a maximally symmetric space time, I want to show you how this works when you have a more complicated situation. So when you really look at complicated gravity solutions rather than just maximally symmetric space times. And you see, these equations will be first order in the fields. Here you have a one derivative of the scalar fields. You have one field strength. So this is another important and interesting fact which is generic about supersymmetric configurations. Supersymmetric configurations must satisfy they must solve the equations of motion, of course. But they must also satisfy the supersymmetry equations, which are first order. And now you know that supersymmetry algebra tells you, closes on shell. So it closes on the equations of motion generically. So this means that if you find solutions to these first order equations, you already solve some of the equations of motion. And in some cases, you solve all the equations of motion. So looking for supersymmetric solutions, now be careful because this is another important concept, uh, means solving first order equations, which are the BPS equations that you get here. But this is not enough to, s to claim that you have a solution. Generically, you also have to solve the equations of motion. Now, there are instances, though, in which the BPS equations imply also all equations of motion. Okay? And I will show you now an example of that. However, remember always this. It's obvious that if you solve the supersymmetry equations, you already have a solution to the equations of motion. Okay? Be careful, because this is a very uh, trivial but uh, rather common mistake. Uh, what you can prove is that if you look for maximally supersymmetric solutions, then, of course, you're looking for 
solutions that preserve all supersymmetries, since all the supercharges will close essentially on all the equations of motion. If you take all possible combinations, then you imply the equations of motion. But if you look at supersymmetry solutions which do not preserve fully the supersymmetry, then genetically what happens is that you have to impose Generally, it's enough to use the supersymmetry equations and the Bianchi identities, and in this case, that's exactly what happens. Since we already solved the Bianchi identities from the beginning, essentially, we remove the vector fields. That's why we are able to solve the equations of motion. But this depends. I mean, you really have to make a, to, to prove it case by case. Okay? It can be more complicated depending on the theory. Now, SUSY implies extremality. Extremality means that you have the minimal mass of the black hole for a given charge. Now the question is, what is the charge that I'm talking about? Because the mass of the black hole is one. Here I have plenty of charges. No, I have n vector fields, and v plus one actually vector fields, because I have also the graviphoton. So I have n v plus one electric charges and n v plus one magnetic charges. So extremal means what here? Well, think about n equals two supersymmetry. Now, if you look at, any, at the algebra of n equals 2 supersymmetry, of course, QQ dagger will close, as usual, on the translation, on p slash. No? You will have that uh, for each of the two charges. So you will have that QA, QB uh, uh, dagger will close on p slash with a delta AB. But now, if you have more than one supercharge, QA, QB is not simply zero generically. This is the interesting thing. Uh, so if I put, let's say, spinor indices here, you get something, well, um, yeah. You get something like this. Well, OK, let me write it like this. You have, here you can have what are called central charges. Now, this is a relation which is going to be true if you have n supersymmetries. Of course, if you have two, this is anti-symmetric in A and B. So since this is anti-symmetric in AB, you can also write this as just one central charge. And here you use the epsilon tensor, no? Epsilon AB, which is the same that I use there, is the usual matrix written like that. Okay. So this is because we are in n equals 2, so you have one central charge. But if you are in higher supersymmetries, then you will have a number of central charges there. OK, central because essentially they will commute with everything else in your algebra. And the relation here will be precisely this. Well, I will explain later. I will show you later. Well, it's really this. The mass of the extremal black hole, of the supersymmetric extremal black hole, will be uh, equal to the value of the central charge at the horizon. So essentially what you're saying is that the, uh, sorry, of the central charge uh, at infinity, that's why you compute it, uh, for the mass. So anyway, the mass is equal to the central charge, which means that the black hole has uh, the minimal mass for a given fixed value of central charge, meaning that if you take masses of the black hole which are smaller than this value, so you say you, I fix the central charge, if I take masses that are smaller, then the, the singularity becomes naked. Okay, then the other black holes, those that have two horizons, have a mass which is bigger than the central charge, and so on and so forth. Now, what is the central charge in n equals two theories? This central charge is the following expression. <coughs> Plus, I think. Yeah, I'm thinking. I have. I think I have a sign mistake in my notes. But anyway, the important thing is that, besides some Kähler potential factor, this is the symplectic uh, product. Ha, now, bad notation again, of what I call z. <laughs> now I have too many z's. I have z's the coordinates, z the central charge, and this is. These are the z sections. If you remember, no, the x and the f that I defined yesterday. The x and the f, I put them together in a z. I don't know how to call it. OK, <laughs> something like that. The important thing is that this is the symplectic product. Why I want to show you that this is the symplectic product? Because 
The fact that it is the symplectic product tells you that, of course, you get the same result if you act at the same time on your sections and on the charges with a symplectic rotation, so with a duality rotation. So the result does not depend on the symplectic frame you choose. So you can rotate the charges, you rotate the sections, and you get exactly the same result. So dualities will not change this value. So you can find different theories with different charges related by a duality transformation that will give you the same central charge and therefore the same configuration, which is what I mentioned yesterday. Now, using properties of the geometry, so now I'm not proving this, I'm just stating that this is the case. Using special geometry, you can prove that the black hole potential that I wrote there, which is given in the terms of those I and R matrices, which are the kinetic terms here, essentially supersymmetry fixes this I and R matrices in terms of the sections and their derivatives. So what you can prove is this, this black hole potential is the central square plus the derivative of the central charge squared. Looks a bit like superpotential no? in, in supergravity. A derivative of the superpotential minus the three times the superpotential square. Here, instead, you have derivatives of the central charge plus, mind the sine and the coefficient, the central charge square. But the structure is essentially the potential is the sum, the algebraic sum generically. The, this, all these potentials are generically algebraic sums of some expression square plus its derivative square because of supersymmetry. Now. Take everything we said. Take the ansatz that I wrote down before, uh, and and uh, take this expression here, and the one-dimensional action. And then you can look and, and, and notice something. If I plug this back now in the Lagrangian, you see, now I have u prime square, so word factor square, plus the derivatives of the scalars with a metric square, plus the potential, and the potential is central charge square and derivatives of z square. And you have to satisfy the Hamiltonian constraint, so the word factor square plus the derivatives of the scalar square should be the same as, worth, as, as central charge square plus derivatives of the central charge square. So right away, if you look at that, you see that you can rewrite your Lagrangian in the following way. Imagine that you want to solve directly the Hamiltonian constraint. No, I have a u prime square on one side, and I have the central charge square on the other side. I have derivatives of the scalars on one side, derivatives of the central charge on the other side. And my action has exactly the same structure only with the opposite sign. Look what I can do. I can take my u prime, e to the, now in order to get the right end here, I have e to the u z square, plus I can write g i j bar, z i prime, and again, plus or minus, 2 e to the, now, again, u, g i j bar, d j bar, z, and of course, then I have here the same thing where I have the j bar, no, I have j bar k, yeah, I should have called this l, l, k, Z. So you see, I rewrite, if I do this, I have a u prime square, which is this. I have <coughs> e to the 2u z square, which is the e to the 2u times the first term that I have. I have z prime squared, which is this. And of course, here you have metric, inverse metric, inverse metric, e to the 2u, a factor of 4. You get that. 
times the e to the 2u. The only problem is that, you see, I also have mixed terms here. No? I now have additional pieces that I don't want. So I have to subtract what I get here from the mixed double product, which is 2 times e to the u, u prime, absolute value of z. And I have to do the same from there, which means subtracting 2 times zi prime di z minus plus 2 times z bar j prime dj bar z. And now if you stare at the last three terms intensely, <laughs> you see something. All these three terms are 2 e to the u central charge total derivative. The first term is the derivative of the e to the u factor. The second and the third are the derivatives of the central charge. The central charge depends on z and on z bar. So you have to take the chain rule, and you get the other two terms. So what does this mean? This means my Lagrangian, one-dimensional Lagrangian, can be written in the form, which is essentially the equations, the BPS equations squared plus total derivative. And this means that if you set the BPS equation to zero, you solve directly the equations of motion coming from that Lagrangian. Because clearly, if they are the BPS square, whatever variation will give you BPS times the variation of the BPS. But if BPS is zero, then the equations of motion are zero. So this means, and you can prove it also explicitly, that these equations of motion follow from the BPS equations. What about the Hamiltonian constraint? Well, the Hamiltonian constraint is immediate here, because we are saying that u prime square is equal to z square times e to the 2u, and z prime square is equal to the derivative. So also the Hamiltonian constraint is satisfied by these BPS equations. So these BPS equations satisfy explicitly all the equations of motion of the original theory. So instead of solving second-order differential equations in order to find the black hole solution, I can solve first-order equations, which is, of course, much more simple. Not only that, this is a boundary term, and the boundary term is related to the ADM mass of the object that I have. And at infinity, of course, the work factor you want to go to 1. I remove the metric, but you remember that in the metric the work factor was e to the 2u you had in front of dt square and in front of the three-dimensional flat part. So of course, at infinity, if you want Minkowski, it should be 1. So this means that the value of the central charge is precisely the mass evaluated at infinity. But we have first-order flow equations. You see, I can solve either u prime is minus or plus e to the 2 uz, and z prime is going to be minus or plus this combination. Now you have two signs, so you might think I have two different types of solutions depending on the sign. And here, uh, physics come to the rescue in the sense that you know that at infinity you want Minkowski space-time, and you want to get towards anti the sitter 2 times S2, where you get towards the horizon. So this tells you that the world factor, e to the minus u, for instance, has to always increase, if you look at the metric, which means that effectively you have to pick uh, one sign, and in particular you have to pick the upper sign in these equations. Okay, so in order to have the flow that I described before from Minkowski to the horizon, with the work factor that goes from flat to anti the sitter 2, then you have to pick really the upper sign here. Which means that, here I have the minus, which means that in the uh, equations I had the u prime is minus e to the u z and z prime is minus this expression. Okay, but these are my BPS equations. So rather than solving these equations of motion, I can forget the equations of motion and the Hamiltonian constraint altogether and write down the BPS equations. And the BPS equations are that uh, e to the minus u prime is the central charge which is always increasing, that's the point, 
and zi prime is minus 2 e to the u gi j bar dj bar of the central charge. So this is describing your flow now. And you see, now these are first order equations, so you see really the meaning. This is really a flow for your scalar fields. Now you solve this equation. The gradient of the central charge tells you what is the flow. It's a one dimensional, it's a, it's a first order equation in Z, which will stop, so Z will stop flowing when? When you get a critical point of Z. When you get an extremum of the central charge. So that's exactly the point. The black hole is an extremal configuration of uh, your uh, theory in the sense that the mass is going to be the minimal for a given central charge because the central charge at the horizon has to be has to sit at the minimum. It, the derivative of the central charge should vanish. And when you get there, the central charge will have, will have a certain value which is going to be positive, and this will give you then uh, the solution for e to the u. And again, if you look at the metric, so let's see what do I need here. I think I can... <coughs> now let me erase this part here. You see that since the metric... Uh, so, first of all, the extremal the extremal central charge is also an extremal point of the potential because the potential is written in terms of the central charge in that way and so if you take a derivative this is essentially uh, two times times the derivative of z this is the derivative of the first piece and then for the second piece you get the derivative yeah uh, k like this, plus the other term, and you see whenever the first derivative of the central charge is zero, this is zero, this is zero, this is zero, so you get at the critical point of the central charge is also a critical point of the full potential. Though this also tells you that critical points of the potentials you can get also when DIZ is not zero. Okay? So whenever the central charge is minimized, then you also minimize the black hole potential, but you can have critical points of the black hole potential where DIZ is not zero. If DIZ is not zero, then you have to solve this equation, which is much more complicated, but you can have solutions. And those are the extremal non-supersymmetric black holes which I will discuss later briefly. But if you look at the BPS equations, then when the derivative is zero, so of the central charge, then the derivative of the potential, of the black hole potential is zero, so you are extremizing the central charge, you're extremizing the black hole potential. At the critical point, get that e to the minus u prime is some value, as I said, which is positive, which means that minus u goes into the central charge times this coordinate w. Remember the w is minus 1 over r, which means that metric, this becomes r, this becomes the following thing. which is precisely ADS2 and this is S2 with a radius, a radius of S2, which is given by the central charge. And why this is uh, important now, because if you want to compute the entropy of this configuration, the entropy is going to be related to the area of the horizon, and so uh, I don't want to erase that. Yeah, let me just erase this part here and then 
we'll see what to do with the rest. The entropy of the black hole to be area over 4. This is going to be 4 pi r square. This is just the central charge square divided by 4. So it's pi times z square. And notice that this is pi times the black hole potential at the critical point because the black hole potential critical point is only z squared because this term is vanishing. So the black hole potential is dictating what is the entropy of your configuration. This, is, this, this follows from the supersymmetric configurations, but you can prove also for the ones that this is true. And now the thing is that since the scalar fields will stop their flow at critical points of z, this means that it doesn't matter where you start. If you are in the basin of attraction of this critical point, no, you will have that doesn't matter where you are in your moduli space. You will have that this is going to be the value at the horizon. And your flows, where uh, you have a central charge that has this critical point, you end up flowing to that critical point. And Critical points of the central charge are actually minima, so you really have basins of attractions. Now you could think, well, if it's a minimum and there are no maxima, because all critical points of the central charge are going to be minima, then there is only one basin of attraction. And I can challenge you <laughs> and to think about it and find that actually you can find functions that multiple basins of attraction, so only minima and no other points. You can find one, it, 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 it was very, there's a very nice function that is written down also in my notes, but I, I didn't find it. it was, I don't remember now who was the guy that, that showed that example, but it's very nice. You can have actually different basins of attraction, because this is a multidimensional space, that's the point, uh, where you have that the only critical points existing are minima, and still you have different reasons of attractions uh, uh, so that you can have uh, different areas of the moduli space which are attracted to different critical points, which means different black hole configurations. And this is interesting for physics because then when you start looking at this uh, from the point of view of the microscopic construction, it gives you lots of interesting dynamics because when you get to the border of these basins of attractions, then essentially uh, the components of your black holes will start dissolving because, of course, you have to move from one side to the other. So there are lo there's lots of interesting physics happening there, which, I, of course, I don't have time to discuss now. But I'm just mentioning that uh, uh, it's interesting to show this. Now, these are first-order flow equations. And I said that these are BPS configuration, meaning supersymmetric, meaning that they solve these equations. But I never them. I just used the bosonic uh, reduced Lagrangian. I showed you that you can write it in a BPS square form, which is suggestive of first order differential equations, like the ones from supersymmetry transformations, but are these really the ones that come from supersymmetry? So I'll we'll show you that briefly and then discuss the non BPS case, but First, let me stop for a minute if there are questions. Yes. Yes. There might, should be some divergences. Uh, think about it. I, I can show you a function which is perfectly regular and fine and has this property. Uh, 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 two variables. Yeah, yeah, it's very confusing. Believe me, I can give you the function later, okay? Come, uh, come after the lecture, I show you the function and you can check. Now the problem here though is multidimensional, it's much more complicated, but the interesting thing is that there are these basins of attractions which are interesting. Any other question? Uh, hi, I have one question. Yep. Can you hear me? Yes. 
so the regularity conditions of the scalars as you mentioned that the derivative of the scalars goes to zero when reached at the horizon so is it only uh, applicable to the extremal case uh, isn't it applicable in the non it's only case? for the extremal case because in the extremal case you cannot have a first derivative which is non zero because it takes an infinite time to get there and if you have something which is non zero it keeps going on for an infinite time, so you reach either plus or minus infinity. In the non-extremal case, the distance is finite, and so you can get there uh, with the first derivative, which is non-zero. I mean, the, the, the equations of motion allow that. These are going to be what are called scalar charges. You can have black holes which have scalar charges on top of the, uh, on top of the uh, regular electromagnetic charges. But uh, this you don't see for, for the extrema configurations. That's exactly the point. Thanks. Anything else? <coughs> okay, so let me discuss briefly the fact that these are BPS. And yeah, okay, let me just, since I want to keep some information here, let me. <coughs> rewrite here the black hole potential. And the question is, if you didn't know how to do this trick, and this trick of the BPS squaring is very nice because I, I can tell you, I mean, it, it saves a lot of work in many instances rather than going through in details uh, through the, 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 the supersymmetry equations. But eventually, if you want to really prove that they are exactly the same, then you have to do that. And of course, because of the ansatz, you expect that also the spinor epsilon will have, might have some dependence on theta and phi. Well, in phi, no, because phi is really an isometry, an explicit isometry. Uh, maybe uh, uh, some, uh, uh, some dependence on theta, but the point is that these killing spinors uh, should then be related also to the killing vector. So you have these isometries, so uh, you should preserve the, 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 the spherical symmetry invariance of your solution also in the definition of your spinors. Uh, and so you expect that out of those equations, you see the variation with respect to the, of the gravitino with respect to the radial variable gives you here the derivative of epsilon with respect to r. So this contains, first of all, the derivative of the supersymmetry parameter plus the terms with the connection, etc., etc., okay? So this is going to be, if you set it to zero, this is going to be a differential equation that fixes for you the, the behavior of epsilon in terms of the radial variable. And eventually you have to solve it, but I mean, whatever it is, it is. Let me not get into the details of the solution because that's not the important message here and that's the important part. If you look at the other, the other indices, Mu can go, I mean, on the time, the radial variable, the theta, and the phi. Uh, again, spherical symmetry will tell you that the information that I get now from uh, the time component uh, is going to be the same as uh, the one from theta and phi. I will not get additional, additional information there, simply because I have only a radial dependence. So let me just look at the time part. And I assume, of course, then that the spinner does not depend on, the, on time. And if I, so I want this to be zero, and I plug in the solution equation there. So first of all, you see, even if the derivative with respect to time is zero, I still get a connection piece here, where this is the connection for my metric. My metric is non-trivial, it's the black hole metric. And in fact, I get here a term which, is, which has this form. It contains the war factor, of course, because this is the metric. And it will contain first derivatives of the war factor because omega, remember, comes from the derivative of the field bind. And, and then I get two gamma matrices times epsilon. Plus, then I have the second piece, the one that comes with the gravi photon. 
And if I plug in all my terms, here I get precisely the central charge times epsilon AB times the gamma matrix gamma 1 and epsilon B. The reason being essentially that, see, if I take zero, no time here, I have time, here I have time and nu. If you remember the answers for our field strength, the only direction which is non-trivial for my field strength is time radial variable, no? Or theta phi. Time radial gives me the charges and theta phi gives me the, the magnetic charges. If you put them all together, that's the expression you get. So now you see I can actually move out gamma 1 because I have gamma 1 here, I have gamma 1 here. Remember gamma 0, gamma 1, uh, they, uh, you, you get the usual relation. No? You have the gamma A, gamma B is 2 eta AB. So if they are different, they anti-commute. So you can uh, pull out the gamma. And then you see I have that in order to solve this equation, after I, I, I remove the gamma 1, I have that gamma 0 applied to my spinor should be proportional to epsilon AB times the spinor. So this is actually what is called the projector. I have to impose that gamma 0 on the spinor is I times a phase, which is going to be the phase of the central charge, times epsilon AB times the spinor. This is a projector in the sense that this is an equation that removes half of the components of the spinor. So it's, it's an equation which you can also, if you wish, as some pi that acts on epsilon and sets it to zero. No? You have some pi AB, let's say, and sets it to zero. So, and this is a projector, so pi squared is equal to pi. These are the conditions for being a projector, meaning that you remove half of the components. So this is telling us that in order to solve the supersymmetry equations, I, I can do that, but I can do it only for half of the supersymmetries. So now at infinity, I have Minkowski. I have full n equals 2 supersymmetry. But then when the flow starts, the black hole configuration preserves only half supersymmetry. I have what is called a half BPS black hole. Okay? So I start from n equals 2, far away, and then the flow is n equals 1, and then what happens is that the horizon, which is at ES2 cross S2, is again n equals 2. There is an announcement. So the supersymmetries are broken along the flow, and then you recover full supersymmetry at the horizon. This is the, this is the solution. And the fact that you break half of the supersymmetries is uh, related to the fact that if you want to solve these equations, you have to impose a projector. Now, generically, when you consider extended, complicated configurations, and you look for BPS solutions, you have to check all these equations, and you might end up having more projectors. And therefore, instead of having just one half BPS configurations, you get one quarter, one eighth, or you might have also projections that are weird in such a way that you get, I don't know, a certain number of supersymmetries are out of the original 32, which is some fractional number, okay? The, th the thing that is telling us this is that you see, well, this is obvious here. It's telling you that the component with A down, so let's say the left-handed components are related to the right-handed components, no, with the, with the opposite number. So let's say you have two spinors, one and two. And this is telling you that the left one is related to the right two spinor. The left two spinors is related to the right one spinor. So instead of having two independent spinors, you have only one at the end. And if you do that, and you plug this equation in here, then from, from this, you just, you're just left with the, with the equation that uh, uh, here there is some e to the u, I guess, which I'm missing. Yeah, I forgot some e to the u. You get, uh, you get the equation that, uh, that we wrote there. 
Okay, if you plug this into there and you check, then you get that this is the equation you get. Now, of course, as I said, in uh, theta and phi, you don't get anything new. You get uh, information if you look at the Gigini. One equation, of course. Then, once again, uh, you use the same projector. If you use the same projector on this equation, once again, here you have only the derivative of the scalar with respect to the radial coordinate, so you get only gamma 1. Here, again, this is, these are fluxes, so you get again gamma 1 and gamma 0. So once again, the same trick, having the same projector, and if you look at the equations, you get precisely this equation here. The BPS equations really come from the supersymmetry transformations. Okay? Now, I have shown you that the BPS equations can be derived in different ways. And I have shown you that extremal, that BPS implies extremality, implies that the central charge is at the critical point, and the critical point of the central charge is also critical point of the scalar potential, the black hole potential. However, if you look at extremal points of the black hole potential, you can find other extremal points where dz is not zero. And these are, again, extremal configurations, extremal black holes, but extremal black holes which are known BPS. What does it mean? Because I'm saying now, I'm claiming that for a given central charge, there, is, there are BPS configurations which are the minimal mass allowed for that given central charge. And now I'm telling you that you can find critical points of the black hole potential which have minimal mass for given charges which are different than the supersymmetric ones. This means that depending on the central charge, there are central charges which allow, to find, allow you to find black hole solutions which are supersymmetric. So for those particular choice of charges, there is a minimum, so minimum uh, value of the mass which gives you a supersymmetric configuration, so there is a critical point of the central charge. There are other values of the charges that you can turn on, which are such that you don't get a critical point of Z. So there is no BPS minimum, but the minimum value of the mass of the black hole comes in the form of a known supersymmetric black hole. So it comes at a point where the derivative of Z is non-zero, the derivative of V is zero. Okay, so this depends on, this, on the value of the central charge. So, of course, when you can have the extremal BPS configuration, you cannot have, for the same charges, the extremal non-BPS configuration. And when you have the extremal non-supersymmetric configuration, you cannot have, for the same charges, the supersymmetric configuration. So either one or the other exists for fixed charges. Now, when I fix the charges, there will be one black hole that has the minimal mass. In some cases, I can have that such a black hole is supersymmetric. In other cases, this is not supersymmetric. But I will still have the minimal, the minimal mass. I will still have the extremal configuration. And now, the interesting thing is the following, that I showed you that from, for BPS, you have first-order equations, and you would expect that, because you have supersymmetry, so you have to satisfy the supersymmetry equations which are first-order. For the non-supersymmetric equations, you should solve the second-order equations that I showed you before. However, there is one feature that is very interesting. Such black hole configurations. As I said, you can imagine black hole configurations as a flow that goes from Minkowski 4, n equals 2, to ADS2 cross S2, and this is the same whether it's supersymmetric uh, or not, okay, it doesn't matter. For extremal configurations, this is always going to be a ADS2 cross S2. Now, in the, in the extremal case, this flow is supersymmetric, so you break supersymmetry from n equals 2 to n equals 1, and you go back to n equals 2 here. In the non-extremal case, this is non-supersymmetric, so the flow is going to be non-supersymmetric. 
But the interesting thing is that there is a function which is monotonic along the solution. And the fact that the there is a function which is monotonic along the solution suggests that there, sh there could be, again, a first-order flow that these scalar fields and all the other quantities satisfy. And the scalar, the, the C function, is actually the work factor. So it's related to the, well, it's, it's uh, I'm not sure it's exactly U or it's some function of U, but anyway, you can prove that uh, the equation of motion that u prime you can obtain u prime from from the Einstein equations as some combination of the Ricci of your configuration times the metric, and using Einstein equations you can prove that this is the same as the stress energy tensor times some vector where this vector has been constructed in such a way that zt squared is minus uh, gtt and zr squared is grr. So you construct a vector that has this property. You can prove this. Uh, I think it was Goldstein, it's Luca Trivedi, probably. I'm not sure I should check the references. Uh, anyway. Uh, they proved that uh, you have that the work factor is essentially your C function. Phi's, well, uh, this is really, I think that this is actually not U, but it's really E to the minus U probably. Anyway, it satisfies, there is some, let's call it A. <laughs> a, which is a function of U, okay? Then let me not now, I don't remember exactly the, 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 the uh, the coefficient, but it's not important. The idea is that if properties of the ansatz that you made and the Einstein equations, you can prove that also for non-supersymmetric solutions of this type, the work factor acts as a C function. So the fact that it acts as a C function, this means that it should have a monotonic behavior and therefore in terms of the radial variable. So this means you can use it in, and replace the radial variable with that, which means that essentially the relation between this work factor and the radial variables should be a first order differential equation. And that's exactly what happens, and you can prove that you can do that by doing the same trick that I did before if you're able to rewrite the black hole potential in terms now instead of the central charge, of a new function, w, in this way. If you, ca if you can find a function w that's such that the black hole potential has this form, then the BPS trick that I showed you before works exactly in the same way, only that now you have w here, w here, and remember, w if W is the central charge, this is BPS. But now I'm assuming that I can find solutions such that this is true. This is non-BPS. And the point is that, well, at first we proved it by using a constructive approach. This function W should be duality invariant because the central charge is duality invariant from what I said before. Uh, and then there was an existence theorem that was proved using the hamilton jacobi formalism that tells you that for this configuration there is always, no matter what is the, the, the black hole potential, you can always find different w's. So you can write the same function in different terms of different w's but with the same combination here. w squared plus dw squared. When w is the central charge you get the BPS solutions, when W is not the central charge, you get the non-BPS solutions. And the interesting thing is that it's still first order. And why it was important to know? It was important because out of these BPS equations for single center, people, since these were first order, have been able to construct uh, very simple equations for multi-center solutions. And then, as I said, when you go to multi-center solutions, from the multi-center solutions, the step to the uh, bubbling the geometry, as it's called nowadays, to construct the microstates is essentially 
uh, well, still not really a minor step, but it's something that is doable. And so in this way, people started to write down candidate macro microstates for these configurations. Okay? So the message is that BPS squaring argument is extremely strong because it works even when this W is not the central charge. When it's the central charge, this, so having the action written as a BPS square doesn't imply that you have supersymmetry. You really have to check the supersymmetry equations. That's the message. When you have the supersymmetry equations, these are going to be first order, but you might have additional first order equations uh, in the non-supersymmetric case. Questions? Uh, no, you can construct, they, they, they prove that you can construct it. Then you use, sorry, I forgot to say one thing, you want to prove that this is monotonic, so you have to use the null energy condition, so you're assuming that the matter is, satisfies the null energy condition. The phi and zeta component are not zero. The phi and zeta component are uh, not zero, I think they are not, I should check now, they, they have really a constructive proof. Okay. I just wanted to give you the message, which is, take some combination of the geometry, you use the Einstein to get the stress energy tensor, and the expression of this derivative is the, the contraction of some vector in terms of the stress energy tensor, and if you use the null energy condition, this, of course, is monotonic. We're getting there. Last few comments. This is n equals two supergravity in four dimensions. If you're interested in understanding and interpreting this in terms of string theory, <coughs> then, and here I will be really very sketchy, but just to give you an idea of what is going to happen, you have to have an idea of where this n equal 2 d equal 4 supergravity comes from. And you know that this comes from type 2 either A or B supergravity, and then string theory, of course, compatified on a Calabi-Yau manifold. So a Calabi-Yau six manifold is a complex and Kähler manifold, so that you have a closed Kähler form, and you also have a closed holomorphic three form. So you, you have that J omega is zero, and then, of course, you have the J, wedge J, wedge J, uh, with a coefficient now, which I forget. Anyway, it's proportional to omega, omega bar. Okay, it's not too important. Uh, the important thing is that you have that these, this is, these are the defining structures. Essentially, J is a 1, 1 form. So J is 1, 1. So imagine that J, as usual, can be written in terms of coordinates in this way. Omega is 3, 0, meaning that it is dzi, dzj, dzk, omega, ijk, so that j omega... Hi, hello. Is it Calabi of 6-fold or Calabi of 3-fold? Sorry? Is it Calabi of 6-fold or Calabi of 3-fold? Calabi of 3-fold, 6 is the real dimension. I wanted yes. to mention yes. that... Okay. I wanted to mention that you go from 10 to 4 dimensional reducing on a 6 dimensional manifold. It's a Calabi Yau yes. threefold, yes. It's yes. a three dimensional complex manifold, so 6 real coordinates. And uh, yeah, well, maybe you put a 1 over 3 factorial, I don't know, whatever. These are conventions, it's not too important. The important thing is that the geometry of the vector sector, of the vector multiple sector, comes out of the compatification of the Calabi. So the killer potential that has the structure that we mentioned yesterday, whether you are in type 2A or in type 2B, is coming from the uh, logarithm of the volume of the Calabi-Yau only on the killer structure, computed by means of the killer structure, or the complex structure. So it depends whether you want to. So the scalar fields in four dimensions are nothing but the deformations of this Calabi-Yau. So either the deformation of the volumes of the Calabi-Yau or the deformation of the complex structure. And depending on 
the theory you start from, one is giving you the geometry of the vector multiples and the other is giving the geometry of the hypers. Okay? This is uh, the geometry of the vectors in the, uh, in the type 2a and in type 2b. And uh, essentially, if you, if you want the projective coordinates and then the normal coordinates in four dimensions are given by integrating, you know, in, in string theory you have the two-form field B. You integrate the complexification B plus IJ over the two cycles. Or if you want the Fs, you do the same thing, but on the four cycles. You take this wedge itself on the four cycles, and you get the other one. So essentially, the geometry of your Calabi-Yau dictates the couplings in four dimensions. And then the charges, as I was mentioning yesterday, the charges of my vector fields are nothing but the charges of my configurations in 10 dimensions. So imagine that these are the six dimensions of your Calabi-Yau, and this is the four-dimensional space-time, Minkowski space-time. Then you know that if you introduce a D0 brain, this will fill only the time direction. If you introduce a D2 brain, this is going to fill the time direction and two space directions. And if these space directions are on the internal manifold, then from the point of your space-time, this is still a point-like charge. For D4s, of course, you can fill four space-time dimensions, D6, so, so five space-time, because you have time plus four space, and D6 will fill the whole volume. And if you do a reduction, for instance, on a very singular Calabia, which is simply the torus mod Z2 cross Z2, then you can see that this is related to the, uh, uh, this is a magnetic charge, which is called P0. These are uh, uh, magnetic charges PI. This is QI, and this is Q0, where I now goes from 1 to 3. Because the scalar manifold that you get in this case is just SU11 over U1 cube. This is the so-called STU model in four dimensions. And the only reason why I'm mentioning this is that, of course, you might have all sorts of configurations and black holes, but as I mentioned yesterday, you only need to study the seed solution for your BPS and for your non-BPS configuration. So let's see, in this theory, how many parameters do you have to fix to fix a solution? You need to fix the value of the three complex scalars at infinity. So I need S at infinity, T at infinity, and U at infinity. As I said, they're called STU models, so the ZI at infinity. These are six parameters, plus four electric and four magnetic charges, because I have three vector fields plus the gravity photon. So I have four electric and four magnetic charges. So this is six plus eight, this is a total of 14 parameters for the generic solution. However, the duality group is going to be the subgroup of symplectic transformations over uh, eight real parameters, which are the charges. And in particular, it's the, uh, this SU11 to the cube. So the duality group is SU11 to the cube, which means fix out of these 14 parameters uh, you can fix uh, uh, nine parameters here. And you have three copies of SU2, no? So three times plus three plus three. So nine parameters. So this means that you only need to take a solution that has five such parameters which are non-trivial to generate the most general one. So if you fix all the scalars, for instance, to one, then you need a black hole with only five charges to generate the most general configuration. 
Because you know that after you study the black hole with five charges, all the others can be obtained just by a duality transformation. Okay? So this is to say that uh, uh, duality is a very powerful tool, to come back to dualities and to say that it is a very powerful tool. Of course, here the counting is very simple. If you change the number of supersymmetries, the configurations, there might be redundancies and things might be a bit more complicated, but the idea is always the same. So, uh, the understanding black holes in four-dimensional supergravity is the first step, if you wish, in order to understand then the macroscopic origin of the entropy for uh, these configurations, because then you want to interpret your four-dimensional supergravities as effective theories coming from string theory, and you will interpret your charges and your black holes as superpositions of the brains in the original string theory. With this, I come to the end. Okay, five minutes, not a great uh, <laughs> advance, but anyway, I finished a bit earlier. Thank you very much, if there are no questions. Thank you again. Questions? Okay, this last part, of course, was a bit more sketchy, but uh, it's okay. I'm still here for a while in case, and again, thank you, and I, I don't uh, know if uh, I get... Uh, ah. Just uh, one uh, a confusion. So I'm missing something. So when you uh, say that the um, along the flow, the supersymmetry is broken, and when we reach the horizon, it is again recovered. So can you please uh, explain it? Sorry, sorry, I didn't get the last part of the question. Uh, I, I mean, when, the, when you explain the attractor mechanism, you uh, told that uh, along the flow, the supersymmetry is broken. We get half, half BPS. Yes. Uh, and when you reach the horizon, it is again recovered. In the supersymmetric case, it's an ass, because you, you have ADS2 crosses two solutions which are maximally supersymmetric, yes. Ah, uh, yeah, 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 okay, okay, yes, thanks. Okay, but uh, that, that there are also solutions which are not supersymmetric, and these are the non-extremal, these are the horizons, the near-horizon geometries of the non-extremal black holes. Okay, okay. It depends essentially on the ratio of the radii of ADS2 and S2, if you wish. In the extremal case that I showed you, they are essentially the same, and they are related to the central charge. If they are related to the central charge, then you get uh, a supersymmetric configuration. If they are not, then you get a non-supersymmetric black hole. Okay? I guess it's okay. I don't know if you have uh, announcements. Yes, yes, thanks. thanks. Yes. Let's thank them, I guess, uh, no, that organized everything. <laughs>